Okay, I'd like to introduce my friend, uh, Juliana Bruno, whom um, a lot of us will love forever because of her essay on Blade Runner, uh, a Ramble City, which added a kind of sense of aesthetic form to some of the, uh, some of Jameson's uh, uh, critiques of uh, uh, postmodernism, and because of that, took the critique uh, a little bit uh, uh, further. The essay, I, I think, um, uh, also was one of the first uh, to develop this notion of uh, history as hysteria, a notion I think that is coming back. Uh, I, I need no, the no, that was nice. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> yeah, I can read my notes up. Okay. <laughs> Uh, uh, an essay um, that developed this notion of history as Sarah, and a notion that I think is uh, 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 still very relevant uh, for China today in a very different context, as we saw, for example, in, uh, in Ning Ying's film, uh, Perpetual Motion. And the other idea that uh, uh, Giorania also spoke about uh, really presently in, in, in her essay, uh, was the idea no longer of Chinatown, uh, which would be, of course, a kind of exotic, uh, 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 ghettoized uh, version of China, but of what you call China in town, right? Uh, uh, of uh, China's uh, global uh, presence. Now, I understand this is the uh, first time Juliana has visited China, so we would cool. say, uh, <laughs> Welcome home, Blade Runner. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> the, uh, now, um, Juliana is a professor of visual and environmental studies at um, Harvard University. She's also uh, affiliated to the uh, Graduate School of um, Design there. Uh, besides Ramble City, of course, she's written a huge number of books. Um, the um, the latest one uh, is this one called Public uh, Intimacy, which has to deal with architecture and the visual arts. Uh, she, but she's also written things like Street Walking on a Ruined Map, which is about uh, modernity and cultural memory, as well as Off Screen, which is, uh, uh, deals with women uh, 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 in film in Italy. Her, probably her, uh, certainly one of her fam most famous books is uh, uh, Atlas of the Emotion, which uh, won a major prize in 2004, and it was cited, I think this is true, uh, as the world's best book on the moving image in 2004. <laughs> and it Heavy inspired, baggage to carry <laughs> around. <laughs> it even inspired a journal uh, called ARIA, which is in, uh, in uh, English and, uh, and uh, 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 Italian. Now, as we said with... Uh, a number of our distinguished speakers. We will not hold any of this against Juliana, but we'll listen <laughs> to a talk with an open mind. So. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, um, Akbar. I'd like to uh, thank Akbar, David Goldberg, and Liu Sola for conceiving of this fabulous idea of this uh, seminar. And also, um, I know it's a thankless job, but we are very thankful uh, to you for doing that. And, and my special thanks to Akbar for finally getting me to uh, China. I've been dreaming of this uh, city ever since I wrote Blade Runner, which I won't say how many years ago it was because I hate dating myself uh, since I'm vain. Um, but as you can imagine, the film was 25 years old, so it's been a long time I've been dreaming of being here, and I'm very happy uh, to be able to uh, speak in, uh, in Shanghai. It's, uh, it's as if the... Like Benjamin said uh, when he talked about history, that uh, that one is thrusted towards the future, uh, looking at the past, and uh, and something in Blade Runner, to my mind, still holds that idea of uh, of history uh, as embedded within the fabric of an urban uh, of an urban culture. Um, I'm going to uh, talk, um, we discussed with Akbar uh, what to do, and, and I'm going to do something that introduces some of the uh, ideas that are in between uh, books, Atlas of Emotion, Public Intimacy, and the new book I'm working on, which is called Visual Fabrics, or Fabrics of the Visual, I haven't decided yet, um, and uh, address this issue of design as the designer space, but also a designer space that includes within itself the folds of time. Um, I think uh, as the more, uh, I haven't 
seen very much in Shanghai, but just walking around even, um, I think one of the interesting things uh, for me to think about is, is how one designs a space by also uh, embedding history without uh, thinking of history as a form of nostalgia, but rather as a kind of fabric of motion or fabric in movement. Uh, so this idea of the moving image, uh, which to my mind dominates the 20th century, uh, the century of modernity, becomes to me especially important in thinking about uh, theorizing uh, in, in a poor way, since uh, this is the poor theory, uh, a form of designer space that might include folds uh, and pleats uh, of time. I'd like to, uh, I'm going to give an example, a specific example of this notion of uh, spatial design and moving image by talking about the intersection between museum and cinema as the two institution of the 20th century of modernity, born with modernity, uh, and therefore, to my mind, born with a form of mobilization of space that also includes a form of mobilization of time. Um, and, uh, and I will travel across uh, art, architecture and cinema in this, uh, in this form of design um, because uh, in many ways, the way I think of design is, is in, a in a kind of very inter uh, disciplinary, or actually I should say transdisciplinary uh, uh, fashion. Um, I want to preface this by saying a few things, and perhaps we can keep this uh, going in the discussion and also on Friday, about how, how do I think of design. I'm not a designer, obviously, in any way, shape, or form. I'm obsessed uh, with design. I'm obsessed with design uh, in probably a kind of the Italian etymological uh, form. Um, Italy is the country where I'm from, um, and, uh, and it, design in Italy is uh, called disegno. And this word disegno is actually has a much larger sense of connotations than the English word design has. Um, it's uh, a friend of mine is working on a dictionary of untranslatable philosophical concepts, and uh, we were just talking about it last week, and I said, you should put the word disegno in, because there's no way to translate it. It's not design. Now, disegno means drawing, so it, it is actually a form of art in many ways, art, drawing as an art form, but it also means drawing as drawing from and drawing to. Uh, it also means drawing as a form of draft, drafting, which is not only a graphic form, but it's also a theoretical form that includes in many ways what Akbar in his Manifesto Pure, Pure Theory uh, uh, talks about in, in many ways as a form of progress or in progress or, or, or like thinking through, rather than through to totalizing clear concept, but through ways of working things through, which is what one does when one drafts or draws. Um, it also includes the word project, uh, and and project also in, is a project in a sense, it's a, also a little larger than the, the connotation of the English word project because it includes forms of projection. So it's project as well as something that, it's not like I have a project, I'm going in a straight line, but rather it's something that is uh, in, in the making, uh, in the form of the making, and it also includes something that's very dear to the way uh, that I theorize notions of design and space, and, and that is to say a relation between a project which is a projection, which means a projection, not only a filmic projection, or, but also a projection that involves a form of inner form of imagination. When you project something outwards or inwards, you operate a form of permeable connection between the inside and the outside. So, um, it's a form, disegno is a form of making of the world, uh, which is, to my mind, a form of fabrication uh, of the world. And I like the idea that in English, fabrication includes the word fabric, uh, which is becoming more and more important uh, to my thoughts on uh, the design of space. Fabric is a form of, of texture, uh, layers, uh, and in this, in this form of folds, as the folds of a dress that in many ways history is included as a form of textural fabrication of space within, uh, within the fabric of the way uh, we conceive of places. Uh, this also includes uh, the body. Um, the, uh, the famous Renaissance anatomist Vesalius uh, draw, draw the human body and call it uh, the humani corporis fabrica in Latin, which means the fabric, 
literally the fabric of the human body. So it's an idea that in a sense encompasses the being in space, the fabric of being in space, as a map of bodies and spaces that includes the fold of history uh, within him. And uh, movement. Um, I want to go back to a, a definition of design uh, all the way back from the 1920s, uh, from Laszlo Moholy Nash, um, a um, important member of the Bauhaus, uh, which, as you all know, was a, a, a school of thought and design that did not separate uh, between the art forms, did not separate between industrial production and the fine arts, and that connected painting, sculpture, uh, photography, photo montage uh, with graphic design, as well as crafting uh, and industrial design. Uh, in, in a very prehescent way, Moholy-Nagy said, spatial design means today a weaving together of spatial elements, which are mostly achieved in invisible, yet clearly discernible relationships of multidimensional movement and in fluctuating energy relationships. Um, so the idea of spatial design was a weaving, and again this notion of fabric and fabrication of spatial element, which are achieved in invisible relationship of movement as well as fluctuating energy uh, relationships. I think uh, in the digital era, we could probably take this uh, uh, with us as we walk into a way in which energy uh, in many, many ways and forms, informs ways in which we understand and interact uh, with the design of space. Um, the design uh, as a multi-dimensional form of movement includes, to my mind, and, and although Laszlo uh, Moholy-Nash doesn't mention it, I think cinema as a kind of metaphor, I think the design in cinema as a form of metaphor for the 20th century form of mobilization of space and time. Um, after all, cinema is the motion picture or the moving image. So an image in motion that moves through space, but also through time, and which to my mind has become uh, more and more of the form of our own museum, the way in which history gets crystallized not monumentalized because it doesn't stop. You cannot stop it. It's something that constantly moves in time and in space, but nonetheless, in that motion, it records and crystallizes fragments of history. And so I take cinema to be a, a metaphor of the way in which I understand this connection uh, between, uh, between, uh, between design. And again, uh, this, uh, I want to reflect therefore today more specifically about uh, what I see happening on the contemporary screens of the art, um, of the moving image and in the changes in the museum space because uh, the more we walk our way into the 21st century, the more it seems to me that it becomes essential to think about how to think of memory outside of a form of monumentalization um, of time. Uh, and to, to think of time in a way that doesn't necessarily uh, mean sculpting in a frozen image, but rather, but rather moving uh, throughout space uh, and throughout uh, forms of interconnecting uh, energies. Um, so um, to, to introduce this uh, connection between the museum and the cinema, or the museum as a cinema, or cinema has the museum, um, I want to turn to uh, Lewis Mumford, a kind of a very interesting American historian of cities and of urban culture, who back in the 1930s understood the importance of talking about cities in relation to technology, something which has obviously become uh, of paramount uh, importance to us. Um, and he reflected back in 1938 on the way in which the museum and the cinema uh, and the city should be conceived as a form that folds uh, and fabricates space together. He said, starting itself as a chance accumulation of relics with no more rhyme or reason than the city itself, the museum presents itself to us as a means of selectively understanding the memorials of culture. What cannot be kept in existence in material form, we may now measure and photograph in still and moving pictures. So he talks about the museum as a chance accumulation of relics, 
that has no more rhyme or reason than the city itself. Now, this is interesting because it's the opposite of the form of monumentalization that one has in certain forms of monuments or, or a museum conceived as a monument, a nostalgic monument to the past, but puts us in the position of thinking of that design as a form of motion, but also in what perhaps Akbar calls a form of arbitrary or an arbitrage, something that is, that is in a sense a chance accumulation. Uh, and also understood back in 1938 the importance of, of thinking of photography and cinema as a form of, of memory, uh, memory space, and to connect them together to the city and the museum. So in the spirit of this observation, uh, I'd like to talk about the museum as a cultural space and see how a for this form of uh, design sensibility has emerged historically as a modern uh, phenomenon. Uh, and especially as, a, as something that I call the design of public intimacy. Um, another thing that the museum and the cinema share, which I think is, becomes more and more important for us to think uh, today, is the relation between private and public. It's how to negotiate uh, the relation between private and public. And uh, public intimacy, which is the title of one of my books, is a kind of oxymoron. Uh, intended there to talk about ways to understand uh, a form of experiential uh, interior dimension uh, that, that belongs to the private in a way that will not be, be dissociated by the public. And in many ways, the museum and the cinema can offer us a model to understand the design of public in intimacy. So I want to uh, walk our way uh, through this uh, connection. Um, first of all, when people think about museum, they shouldn't think of it as an isolated space. Uh, and what's interesting to me is that the museum was born historically exactly at the same time as the cinema. And that is not an accident, uh, or it is actually a wonderful accident of history, uh, uh, a very nice form of um, uh, arbitrary, uh, quote unquote, connection. Um, they are both places that imaginatively share this form of public intimacy because they both emerged out of a process of mobilization as products of an era that activated a different way of seeing, uh, which was a gaze in motion and in sequence, um, mobilized, but also narrativized space. My making motion made it possible to create forms of experiential stories and dramas uh, that, uh, that, that happened in space, and created, therefore, the actual experience of spectatorship. Uh, in fact, the experience of spectatorship as we know it today is born out of that uh, connection in modernity. Public spaces, uh, they are, but they also share a private dimension. They're visited in spectatorial itineraries that, that in fact trigger very intimate responses that involve imagination and most importantly, affects. Um, and we're, we very often are um, put in the position of questioning also um, sites of memory. Uh, in both places, intimacy occurs in public. So the museum and the cinema in this way share a kind of form of tangible sensibility, uh, a form of design sensibility that developed uh, on a journey um, of connection between the two. So the, what I want to do today is to take you through the journey that made this connection uh, possible um, and, and, and look at the 20th century as characterized by what the art historian Alois Riegel called a modern cult of memory. So how can we speak of a memory um, in a modern way? Now Rigo, uh, a, a very interesting art historian who in fact uh, was the curator of textile uh, and understood the fabrics of uh, history and very important um, in, 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 un, in, in switching gears from just optical and visual to understanding the materiality of culture said that the 20th century is in fact characterized by a modern cult of memory uh, which he defined in this way, he said that age value of this century consists in giving emotional effects evoked by a mere sensory perception. This modern sensibility manifests itself, he said, immediately through visual perception and, uh, but appeals directly to our emotions." End quote. 
in this sense, in many ways, we can think of a museal sensibility as emerging from the culture of modernity, engaging the materiality, the material of culture, the haptic, uh, an experience of also of intimate transport, and a relation between motion uh, and emotion. Now, let me uh, clarify for you these three concepts that are uh, important in the way that I think about the designer space. So, haptic, um, intimate transport, and a relation between motion and emotion. Let me start with haptic. <clears throat> now, I, I apologize, uh, but the, uh, the, this is a Bruegel, this is really way too yellow. Bruegel uh, would be cringing in his grave, he's probably is hating me right now, but that's what, uh, that's what image technology is doing to a 1618 uh, beautiful painting. Um, so uh, this is a painting uh, of the census of Bruegel, uh, produced in, in 1618. Uh, and um, uh, interestingly enough, um, it connects, as you could see, the sense of touch, which is the haptic, um, to the sense of taste, um, and also to the sense of smell, but not precisely to the sense of sight. Uh, so the, the actual uh, painting in many ways emphasizes a synchrony of the senses that puts vision in a lesser uh, important uh, 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 position than it usually is in Western culture, and that's one of the reasons why I'm interested in this. Now, looking at this, we, we probably understand uh, the idea of haptic. Haptic uh, comes from a Greek etymology, from a Greek word which means more than the sense of touch. Uh, in fact, it means able to come into contact with. Uh, and it's interesting that in English, when you say contact, which is the form of communication, uh, which is very important, obviously, in design, you, within this idea of contact, you have written into it, in the, in the word itself, the sense of tact, uh, the sense of touching. So to me, a, f a form of communication, of design communication, that is a form of contact between us and the environment must include the sense of touch, the haptic. Uh, as a sensory interaction, also, the haptic is very connected to kinesthesia, which is the ability of our bodies not only uh, to touch, but to also to sense movement in space. So I'm arguing that the mobilization of space that takes place in the modernity, in cinema, and in the museum is a haptic experience, and that instead of being confined to optical readings, in order to speak of a different modern design of space, which include uh, the modern cult of memory, as Rigo puts it, we should really shift from optic to haptic and, and speak of a tangible uh, use of space. Uh, and haptic will also help us understand the habitable sense of sights and the intimate experience uh, that is offered to us as we walk uh, through these spaces. The, the major premise of this shift between optic to haptic uh, is also that motion produces emotion and that correlatively emotion contains a movement. Um, here again, um, um, I'm showing you a map uh, from 1957, which was a psychogeographic uh, map of Paris. Um, uh, that was produced by the Situationist, uh, which took the map of Paris and literally created a kind of assemblage, a cinematic montage, connecting together uh, the spaces of the city, not by way in which they are actually positioned on a real map, but the way in which they're positioned on our inner map, in our psychic space. So places will be related together in a city for us, not only because they're next to each other physically, but they may be very far apart, but be connected by our own experience. So this is a sense of experiential transportation to space and a form of reimagining the motion of a city as a form of emotion. So psychic space in relation to actual and virtual space. And interestingly, um, in this form of, of connection uh, between motion and emotion, uh, cinema plays an important part. In this form of redesigning of the map of Paris 
It's a kind of sequential approach, a cinematic reassemblage, an assemblage, montage of the city that takes place. Um, no wonder. Um, I, I like excavating um, into words. Uh, it's li the literary historian, uh, scholar in me, uh, that likes o thinking also of history as a form of archaeology, of excavation, that sometimes uh, words carry their thoughts throughout periods of time and in the fabrics of the words you find uh, connections that have been lost. So uh, one, one day I was actually uh, looking at the etymology of the word cinema. Um, and um, for years, I, for seven years in Italy, I was forced to study ancient Greek uh, and ancient Latin. And, and for years I thought, what am I doing this for? Why are they teaching me English? It would be so much more useful. And one day, finally, I realized that there was a reason when I found the etymology of kinema and I could read the old Greek words. Uh, and cinema comes from kinema, which means both motion and emotion, um, which I thought was just fabulous. It was worth the seven years of ancient Greek. Um, and so film, in fact, moves. It not only moves, but it moves us. Uh, with its ability to render affects and in turn to affect us. It also moves to incorporate other spaces that produce a similar kind of intimate uh, public uh, response. So I want to show you that motion, the emotion and the emotion of cinema can as indeed existed even outside of the walls of the movie theater and as in fact uh, permeating the performative space of the art gallery and the itinerary itself that we take in a museum and, and the museum walk all the way uh, from ancient times through today. Uh, even when you look at the way in which a collection such as this uh, that you see in the views of modern Rome uh, from 1755, uh, you realize that the idea of sequential framing sequences, assemblage, montage, collection of images that produce recollection uh, has been at the basis of some of the forms of understanding the art gallery uh, from the er very early days of modernity uh, to today's uh, moving image installation in the current uh, art galleries. So I'm going to do this tour by beginning with the present time and walking my way backwards uh, into history. Um, now, as, as we all know, um, the convergence of the museum with the cinema um, is, a, is a contemporary uh, phenomenon. Um, it's a contemporary phenomenon, however, which is not new because in many ways began in the age of modernity as a way to mobilize the relation between collection and recollection. Uh, this has become uh, a very important strain in contemporary Western uh, visual culture uh, today. And one of the things that's interesting to me in terms of talking about this fabrication and folds of history is to see ways in which, although very contemporary and very trendy, uh, this relation is in, fact, uh, is in fact has folds and fabrics of the past uh, built uh, within it as forms of reinventions of collection and recollection. Now, uh, what we see today as we walk through art galleries and museum spaces is a kind of collapse um, between um, the museum and the cinema experience, especially in the art installation. Um, motion pictures have exited the movie house to take up residence in the museum. They've changed address and have become in different forms a feature of gallery shows and museum exhibition. Um, this, I think, um, is an exchange that actually changes the way in which we understand visual archives. Um, what I want to get at is how this actually informs our forms of memory and our forms of uh, visual uh, archive. Now, in a very uh, concrete form, what you see is a number of Western uh, filmmakers being interested in making a uh, moving image installation. And the number is growing. But not only that, but interestingly enough, the people who are doing it are actually the filmmakers who are mostly engaged in rethinking the language of cinema. So they're walking their way into, an, into the art installation mode, reimagining cinema. Uh, some of them include, for example, Chantal Ackerman, whose work uh, you see here. This is her installation of her film uh, Dest, uh, which toured uh, a number of museums uh, 
um, including having a retrospective at Bobu uh, and uh, at the Jewish Museum in Berlin. Now, as you can see, in Chantal Ackerman's decomposition of her film Dest, uh, here in the form of an art installation, what happens here is that film is literally dislocated. Uh, motion pictures is housed in monitors that are spread across the gallery space. And so what you do have is, is in a sense, the experience of walking into a film, like literally, in a sense, materializing a form of virtual connection, association that usually happens in your head in cinema, which becomes a form of re-editing and reassemblage and remontage, which involves a kind of motion through uh, space as well as emotion uh, through time. So physically retraversing the language of montage. This kind of um, passage uh, signals a connection that's becoming more and more evident between art, architecture, and cinema predicated on the idea itself of exhibition. Uh, and it's perhaps uh, Peter Greenaway who's made the most of this um, with his uh, latest uh, installation, but also with a form of kind of uh, poor theorizing, let's say, of this, uh, in, of this concept in his work. He said, um, musing about the relation between cinema and the museum, uh, isn't cinema an exhibition uh, after all? And perhaps we can now imagine a cinema where both an audience and an exhibition can move. Now, in fact, what, is, what I'm showing here is uh, a work from uh, uh, of reinvention of Leonardo's Last Supper uh, in Milano from, uh, from, from last year, in which what he did is basically he used digital technology to animate the space of a painting. Um, and I just uh, came back from uh, Venice, the Venice Biennale, and I saw another piece of his uh, uh, in the Venice Biennale, which did something very similar, where in a sense he, he entered into the paintings and, and did what usually we do with our mental and also with our eyes as we read a painting. So he redefined the motion that you make through the type of assemblage and the movements of connection of spaces and, and, and actually kind of made a film of the painting by activating it with light and by also making maps of the connections that existed spatially and historically within the painting itself. <clears throat> Very often, uh, therefore, this movement also questions the idea of spectatorship itself. What do you have here? Is this an audience of a movie theater? Is this a gallery-going audience? What is this connection between uh, motion uh, and spectating? And also with memory. I mean, in many ways, he's using digital technology to bring into the fore um, the Im images of the past, uh, paintings that have been iconic uh, moments in, in the history of Western culture and art history. And his, his exhibition in, in Venice was packed. It's becoming a kind of formal also uh, popularizing of, of this, which is, which is hitting uh, the popular imagination. So this question of memory more and more and how you redefine forms of memory with digital technology is being reactivated by uh, filmmakers who are making art installations. And, and that's also the case uh, uh, very prominently for uh, someone whose work I, I really love, Isaac Julian, um, a British uh, uh, filmmaker, a black British filmmaker who uh, has made a number of works. Uh, here, uh, what you see is uh, an installation uh, called Vagabondia, uh, uh, which he did uh, in the museum uh, of Sir John Soane. Sir John Sohn was the architect of the Bank of England, um, and he had an, an unbelievably interesting art collection. It's one of the most beautiful, if you ever find yourself in London, house museums uh, that exist. And when he died, he actually managed to pass a bill that nothing could be changed. So in many ways, this was the ultimate sense of how do you deal with memory. You have a place that's a monumental, it's frozen. Nobody can move anything at all in this museum. They can't even light it differently. So how do you deal with something that is this frozen in time? So what Isaac Julian did is that he made a film in which he activated, by way of moving images, the sense of recollection that comes with the collection. So what you see here is, um, is something that explores 
the forms of storing of paintings in this museum. So going into the sheets, what Deleuze called sheets of the past. Again, in other words, that uh, is very much uh, involved with fabrics. Uh, sheets, after all, are pieces of fabric. So thinking of folding and refolding elements of collection and recollection uh, between this. So moving images have made their ways into the art gallery and the museum, returning spectatorship to a form of exhibition. Um, the rooms of the museum are very often even becoming a, a literal projection room, turning into filmic space. And some artists, uh, for example, Pierre Huyghe, are actually um, directly thinking about redesigning the space of an art gallery and the space of the museum to reflect this form of relation, a uh, fluid, much more fluid relation between art, architecture, and cinema. Uh, what I'm showing you here is uh, the last exhibition, sadly, uh, in, from 2003 of the DIA Foundation for the Arts in New York, uh, in which Pierre Uyghe basically began uh, with a kind of moving architectural is design that at first was an empty art gallery space or looked like an empty art gallery space, and then, but surely you would see that the, 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 the white cube uh, would change and that the walls of the art galleries would turn inwards uh, and then they would become like monochromatic paintings as if it was an exhibition of Rothko's uh, paintings. But then, but then they would come, come closer and closer in and in the end it would turn into a dark cube. Inside, in the third image, what you do see is uh, in fact a movie theater, a projection room. So here you have sculpture, architecture, paintings and cinema all together within the space of a redefined design of space. Um, other artists uh, are doing similar things. This is Janet Cardiff, um, uh, a Canadian artist uh, who made this installation called the Paradise Institute in which uh, she uh, reinvented a movie theater uh, in an art gallery. And, and as a gallery goer, you go and sit in this uh, movie theater and when you put your headphones on, not only do you listen to the film, but actually you do something that it's interesting, you listen to your own thoughts. Um, so that it relates this motion outside to your own forms of imagination, to the inner motion of your mental space. Everything that happens when you actually do see a film, uh, where you connect to something mentally. You don't move physically, but you move mentally and virtually within uh, your own head. Um, so, what I mean to say here is that in many ways, the history of cinema is becoming a kind of memory space for contemporary Western artists, and that they're turning the art installations into, and the cinema into moving memory visual archives. Um, perhaps the most example, uh, the most important example I can think of is that of Chris Marker, uh, who's an 82-year-old um, filmmaker who made uh, very, very interesting, important films, and who has adapted to digital technology in a way that is incredibly fascinating. He's created uh, this project called In Memory, uh, which is uh, not memory as a monument, but memory as a form of chance accumulation and also as an exploration of collection and recollection. And he's also bought uh, property on Second Life. Uh, so if, uh, those of you who uh, who are playing with your computers uh, back there and are falling asleep, listening to me, you can probably go online as you do somewhere over there and look at virtual space if you, if you feel like multitasking. Um, so the virtual Second Life uh, project of Chris Market is in fact an interesting way of understanding this relation uh, between uh, movement and, and memory. Um, Douglas Gordon, uh, someone uh, very well known and probably most literally uh, turning the history of cinema in a way in a history of memory in which he redefines a number of, of, of um, important landmarks of the history of film uh, and remakes them into uh, art installations. This is one of uh, his lesser known ones. Uh, that, uh, that, that deals with an archival film from 1908, uh, which is about the history of hysteria. I thought I would do that for you. <laughs> so, the, the, um, and of course, uh, Bell Viola, uh, who's often also used loops um, 
in his, uh, in his ways of imagining forms of memory. And I want to say a couple of things about this idea of the loop. Uh, this is from a Bill Viola's installation called uh, Slowly Turning Narrative. Um, now, the loop is obviously a cinematic uh, feature and something which, which, is, uh, um, I, which I think is an important and interesting way to think about memory. And, and it's a very, uh, it's a new technology because it's, it's obviously part of, the, of modernity, but it's also an extremely old technology. Uh, what I'm interested in is the fact that one of the people who invented the art of memory, which uh, Ramon Lal, in the 13th century, uh, or actually practiced the art of memory, was uh, sort of invented by uh, Simonides in much earlier on, it did it so by putting uh, memory images on turning wheels. So that the idea of memory and motion was in fact part of the actual essential way in which memory had been thought of. So the loop uh, as a kind of form of recurring, uh, reoccurring uh, forms of recollection is in fact an old, an old form of technology. So the cinematic loops, uh, which is haunting the art gallery today, is becoming in fact an actual loop of memory. Um, Cinema existed today for Western artists outside of cinema as a historic space. It exists as a kind of mnemonic history which is fundamentally linked to a technology. So when we walk into a museum space or a gallery space, we often encounter fragments and crystallization of this history being asked to walk not only through but even into uh, cinema to experience not only the, uh, the actual sense, but the very, very motion of, of cinema, which is also a motion of virtuality and a motion of liminality. Now, this is a very uh, contemporary and perhaps even uh, current and even trendy phenomenon, but as I said, uh, it's actually has a history. Um, and what I want to do is that many um, film historians talk about the death of cinema um, and they're horrified by the idea that this is happening, that cinema no longer exists as, a, as what we know as cinema in a movie theater. And I happen to be feeling differently. First of all, I'm interested in things that are dead. Um, I think this tremendous fascination, uh, again, fascination being uh, the sense of what really drives me to theorize anything in, in death. Um, uh, after all, cinema is a remake of a mummy. Uh, to me, uh, it's one of the most ancient and yet new form of uh, memories, a material fabrication of memory is a mummy. Um, and cinema has an imprint of your face. The second that you record it, it's gone forever, but at the same time, it's there forever. So this is kind of interesting sense, uh, I think, of connection uh, between death uh, and cinema. So in this form of death of cinema, there is a kind of rebirth uh, that happens that, to my mind, also uh, takes us back. Um, I happen to think that what's happening today in many ways in the age of post-cinema relates not to the cinematic age, but to the age of pre-cinema. That something that's going on, at least in Western culture, which is what I know uh, and I'm speaking of, is, is that there's a connection happening on the screen of contemporary visual culture that is taking us to a moment back in time and to potentialities that emerged at the time of the birth of the cinema that actually did not necessarily go into the dominant Hollywood-like way that we know of cinema, but they remained open as forms of open exhibition. So that the loop of time uh, and the form of reinvention of history that I'm speaking of is a connection between the age of post-cinema and the age of pre-cinema. And, uh, and I want to walk you through uh, some of these spaces of pre-cinema uh, to see how they relate to the design of space that emerged as a, as a form of, of modernity uh, that I think might be interesting uh, today. Now, as an art of projection, and, and, I, and again, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, I mean projection as literal projection, but also a projection of the self, of the inner self, which is important in, the, uh, in cinema. Cinema emerged from a specific design, uh, from a, a kind of design that involved uh, a rethinking of the architecture itself of vision uh, as an interactive geovisual culture and as a form of installation avant la lettre. 
This is a magic lantern from 1646, uh, and it may as well be a form of contemporary uh, art uh, installation. The, uh, there was, in fact, a number of practices of curiosity and museographic spectacles uh, that existed at the, at the time of pre-cinema, before the cinema was invented, that became the type of public architecture of intimacy uh, that became the cinema. And it was a spectacular theatrics of image collection that activated forms of recollection. Uh, besides uh, the magic lanterns, there were spaces like the Cosmorama rooms, uh, which again um, very, uh, is, were spaces in which you went actually to walk around the space and to look uh, at things that were happening behind uh, the forms of projection behind the curtains. Uh, so when you look at something like Pipilotti Rist making little insets in a gallery spacing and doing back projections, you realize that in fact this is a kind of uh, resonance uh, to a form of viewing that in fact was a form of, of, of theatrics of vision and architectural vision of, 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 pre, of the early times of modernity. Um, anatomical theaters uh, with their design of the fabric of the human body, uh, the humani corporis fabrica, which I spoke uh, earlier on. Um, cabinets of curiosity, uh, of course, um, world collections uh, turned museums as, uh, as this. Um, and um, also interesting forms of inside-outside, of, of geo-global uh, cultures. Uh, the culture of cinema came from a kind of obsession uh, with, uh, with, with the globe and with, uh, with forms of entering within, uh, within the globe itself as a form of vision. Here is a fabulous panorama uh, paintings shaped uh, in the shape of an eye uh, from 1829. Uh, fluid types of visions that actually uh, created assemblages and motion through space. Um, such as, uh, as these forms of, of, uh, of panorama paintings, as well as a number of other techniques for viewing collection of images. Uh, now, this is a, uh, an image from the 19th century. It looks like a televisual apparatus. Uh, uh, I, I like this one very much because it actually is really uh, the kind of uh, error of history uh, that looks forward by looking backwards. Uh, so it's not a television set, it's actually an apparatus for rolling panoramic wallpaper. So it, it, uh, it signifies the fabrication of space, uh, the folding of space for me. So cinema came out of this form of uh, uh, installation, uh, architectural installation and design of uh, installation design, uh, avant la lettre. What turned into cinema was in fact a kind of physical and yet virtual uh, traversal of the sites of display in an era that in fact invented the notion itself of public intimacy, of a consumption of space of images in public, but very much in which you could also, in many ways, experience uh, the drama itself of spectating uh, with a community of strangers, so being looking um, together. Now, to also uh, continue to, to explain this notion of collection and recollection as being fundamentally linked to an idea of montage, and uh, cinematic montage, and to an idea of also moving through space, sequentially moving through montage of images, um, it's important to turn back uh, also to Eisenstein, one of the first uh, filmmakers who understood the connection between architecture and film, and in fact theorized that uh, Archi the, the, the Acropolis of Athens, uh, the design of the Acropolis of Athens was the first film. Um, that the first film is in fact a city, the design of a city. And the reason why is because nobody could in fact understand the design of the Acropolis of Athens until they understood that it was not imagined to be looked at as, as, a, as a flat view, but it was to be experienced in motion. And so Eisenstein said that that's in fact what we do in cinema today and what we do more and more with digital technology was in fact embedded in the most ancient form of architectural design. Is that in architectural design, the building doesn't move, 
but we move through space. A city always moves, and moves, in fact, it's this kind of viewing sequentially in motion that we've been experiencing in architecture uh, that is reflected and re-experienced in cinema, where the spectator doesn't move, but mentally and imaginatively and effectively one moves through space. Now, Eisenstein's imaginistic way of connecting um, collection and recollection bears also another fold, another sheet of the past, another mark of history, and that's, in fact, the idea itself of the art of memory. I've always been interested in the fact that besides the fact that the art of memory itself was conceived as a loop of images, as moving images on rotating wheels, is that the notion itself of the art of memory coming from the Greek poet Simonides and then developed in the first century AD by Quintilian and then later uh, also and by Cicero as well, um, is something that makes us understand that memory was always designed that there is a design in memory. Memory was always designed and designed architecturally. Um, what Quintilian said is that in order to create a memory, uh, what you would do is that you would imagine a space. And he literally says you can imagine a room, a building, and he says even a city. Uh, and then you place the image in a corner of that space. And then you continually place your collection of images in different points of space as if you were literally an interior designer, as if you were decorating those images. And to remember, you would retraverse the space. Um, and, and in that way, you would recollect your collection of images. Uh, now, the act of memory was an extremely influential uh, way of thinking. Um, and this is something very interesting that we have sort of forgotten, and I think this forgetfulness is probably uh, hurting us today, is that in a sense the one was trained. Memory is not something that happens on its own. We're now, they, we think that memories just come up and they come back and they go. Of course, Freud uh, has taught us otherwise as well. But what I'm interested in is not the psychoanalytic dimension, but this dimension of design, uh, the idea of the architecture of memory uh, itself, the fact that it is material and spatial, but also uh, intimate and imaginative. A number of memory theaters uh, were created uh, all the way uh, through the Renaissance. Here you see one reconstruction of, of a famous memory theater. And the memory theater was, was a kind of collection of images that imaginatively uh, related mental images to inner images. So it's not only what we see as a kind of visual perception, but also how the image affects our forms of imaging and imagining mental space. Uh, and also how it, it also collects the affects. Um, the philosopher uh, Giordano Bruno, um, that uh, unfortunately has the same last name as mine, has been uh, another heavy, uh, heavy baggage on my shoulders. I'm only happy that my parents didn't call me Giordana Bruno, it would have been a nightmare. Um, it's uh, it actually said something about recollection as being a form of reenactment of experience, which involves, he said, not only forms of imagination, but also affects, forms of emotion. Um, these are uh, the first, uh, the first example of magic lanterns from 1750s that I found in the Museum of Cinema in Turin. Uh, and it was interesting, they could never explain why they had this thing there. And I said, oh, well, you obviously have it because with the magic lantern was the first time that you could show emotion in movement. And so the idea was that emotion moves and moves us, that cinema is in fact born as this form of kinema that connects both motion and uh, emotion. Now, the idea that uh, the design of space as a design of time must involve memory, imagination, and affects was also um, uh, moved forward in the 17th century cartography. Uh, what you have here is an image from 1654 uh, made by a woman, um, uh, very recently uh, a, a feminist theorist um, whose name I will not repeat, said that women cannot read maps. Uh, well, here is a woman who actually made maps in uh, 1654 and designed uh, the first map of inner space or map of uh, a landscape, an exterior landscape that reflects an interior landscape. Uh, it was called La Carte du Pays de Tendre, 
uh, the map of the land of tenderness. Um, and it's a kind of very cinematic map because it has no borders. You can see that the dangerous seas flows outwards, the sea of enmity is, uh, is what we call off screen or out of frame. Um, and that, and that is a map that needs to be traversed. There are spectators inserted into it, which are walking their way through cities. And cities and villages are designed in this map to house affects, their dwellings of emotions in which you enter and exit. For example, in the, the little uh, promontory uh, place that you see next to the Black Sea, this was the House of Pride. Um, and that's exactly what you do when you feel that way. You, you walk your way through this little space up on top and you sit there and you don't want to get out. Uh, and most importantly, the only thing that does not move on this map is a lake, which is called the lake of indifference. Uh, and in fact, indifference is the lack of emotion, is when nothing moves and you're stuck there. You can't go anywhere. So the, in fact, the design of the exterior here, like literally metaphorically, is connected, in fact, to the design of a form of inner uh, mental images in inner space. For the walking our way uh, through history uh, to imagine the recollection of space, uh, the design of garden, actually landscape design, I think has been extremely important in shaping the notion of experiential design, design as a form of experience. Um, and the, especially I would say the picturesque, uh, which has been denigrated throughout history as being feminine space, um, and perhaps for this reason, uh, particularly interesting. Um, now, in the picturesque space, uh, what, what you had was, in a way, a form of walking your way through a space in which the physical walking was a form of fencing, which was a, fencing was con conceived as a series of connections made in imaginative tracks. Uh, so that forms of imaginations were related to form of imaging. And so picturing in the space was also picturing a form of sensing that in many ways uh, would create a kind of hyper-sensorial, imaginistic way. And the most important, I think, uh, idea of the picturesque to take uh, out into design is that as uh, in the picturesque enabled the imagination to form the habit of feeling through the eye. So that, in fact, touching is not only a matter of the hand, but that you can imagine the optical being haptical, that you can imagine feeling uh, through the eye. This is um, something that, uh, in fact, uh, happened uh, in many ways in the cinema, where literally gardens, the design, landscape design, so the design of an exterior space became the design of the interior space of the movie theaters in the 1920s, where you see that this connection between interior and exteriors was theatricalized as a form of permeable design of space. And then, of course, uh, uh, Le Corbusier uh, picked up this idea uh, together with Eisenstein. They both uh, said Corbusier and Eisenstein met once and Corbusier said that he was thinking in architecture exactly the way in which Eisenstein was thinking in cinema. And of course his idea of an architectural promenade, of a way of walking um, through space, offering uh, views consecutively, playing with the flood of light, uh, became in fact a form of architectural uh, modernist design. Light. Um, I think is an important uh, way in which we can also understand uh, memory. Here is an image from the Jewish Museum um, in Berlin from Daniel Lipskind, who did something quite interesting. I think it looked much better when it was empty like this than when it is now full of uh, stuff. Uh, what he did is that he connected through these images of light spaces outside the, him the city of Berlin where everything, all memory had been in fact erased. Um, and, but that the memory would remain in the form of light that was connecting different spaces inside the museum to particularly points outside of the city where certain important Jewish intellectual lived. So that every single flow of light would in fact connect somewhere out to the map 
of the cultural map of the city. And I think this is an important way to imagine how erasure can be, not in, can be actually worked on and something you talk about in uh, manifesto about thinking about what's actually, what you can make out of something that's not even no longer there and, and even the faults of history uh, such as the erasure. Uh, light, of course, uh, is a crucial element uh, of the cinema. Uh, cinema is nothing but uh, an architecture of light and an architecture of vision. So um, what you see today uh, is the reinvention of this form of walking through spaces of light uh, with museum spaces. Uh, here is Jean Nouvel, uh, Institut du Monde Arabe uh, in Paris, which are increasingly imagining the architecture of a place as, an ar as a form of architecture of light. Here you have windows that are actually shutters, uh, filmic and photographic shutters. So the connection between the window and the screen and the frame is becoming much more, uh, much more uh, close. Uh, and especially, I would say, in the work of Herzog, and Demeron, and this is the very recent museum uh, that they built in San Francisco, which actually plays with the fabric of light as a form of texture of history for, uh, for architecture. So she who wanders through an installation space uh, more and more, I think, um, recalls the experience itself of traversing light uh, spaces. An editing splice and a loop is connecting the turn of the last century to the dawn of the millennium in a kind of musing that relates to my mind a form of wandering with a form of wandering, a fascination with a form of seeing which is also a form of walking into and through, uh, and through space. Now, at the end, um, I just want to conclude by stressing a couple of ideas uh, that relate to this notion of the design of space, the loop between the turn of the last century and the beginning of the new millennium, pre-cinema and post-cinema. Uh, cinema is linked to the museum as a form of haptic design, uh, which to my mind me needs to mean a layered history of public intimacy. Uh, and a matter of folding and refolding spaces and coded uh, materials. Um, I'm interested in the fact that one says film, uh, and film also means uh, veneer, means form of coding. So there's something about the way in which, in a sense, the resonance and the residue of something can be built uh, within, uh, within the future, remaining without, within itself as folds of space, as sheets of the past. The museum and the cinema should be imagined as textural places, as fabrications of visual fabrics, as moving archives of imaging. And so to rethink them together actually means to refashion them uh, as a form of cultural fabric. After all, when we think of space, we know that the way we use space is to suit ourselves in space. Space is, in fact, our third fabric. The first is our skin, the second is fashion, and the third is architecture. So there is a form of haptic bond that in many ways links dressing, uh, coding, uh, suiting uh, to space. Um, and again, uh, perhaps the Italian uh, would come to my aid in this form of uh, uh, design uh, theorization. In Italian you used uh, lingua like this. You use the same word, uh, abito, Abito means both dress and address. You would say abito to say it's a dress, but you would also say abito to indicate a form of dwelling. Um, in German too, Wand, and this was used very much by Semper, who, a very interesting theorist who talked about textual design in architecture. Wand, which means both wall, but also screen. Um, so there's a very kind of, uh, uh, Asian idea, is connected to gewand, which means garment or clothing. In other words, space is as delicate as a dress. It is a fabric that is not only worn, but can wear out. To occupy a space is literally means to wear it. And to wear it means that a cultural landscape can and should show its wear. Uh, 
its decrep its what Blade Runner called accelerated decrepitude, uh, its ruins, because it is in many ways space is always the trace of the memories, the attention, the imagination, and the affects of those inhabitant passengers who have traversed it at different times. A palpable imprint is always left in a, in, a, in a space as a geography of remnants of the, the experience of traversal and of inner sense that is the emotion of the viewers. And that happens again um, in the public intimacy of the uh, museum space where the dramas of spectatorship is lived as a form of narrative as it is also lived uh, in the movie theater. After all, uh, Art, as Abi Warburg said, was a place where the language of gestures compels one to relieve the experience of human emotion, which means the representation of life in motion. So we went from the art historical collection of image to today's installation to cinema. Um, Today, cinema and museum are rejoining again in the design of visual fabrics, and cinema reenacts this step of pre-cinema, continuing to be held in the space of public intimacy that transporting us backwards. Um, in the museum, what happened uh, in, the, in the movie theater is now rehappening in the projection of light spaces in the museum. So the voyage around my room, which was once held uh, in this form of a movie, a movie house, uh, here is a Kistler exemption, is coming back together in forms of installation uh, such as that of Olafur Eliasson recently at the Tate, where we can re-experience with forms of light spaces, experiences of public intimacy and inner sensing that appeared to be uh, taken away uh, from us. And the important thing to my mind is that the design of the space therefore should not be uh, a form of only exterior design, but an actual form of interior design, because in the public architecture, of the moving image, a texture screen can and does project, in fact, an extremely intimate text, uh, which is a kind of inner film that is uh, our own museum. So memory, not as an outside space, but also as an inside space. And I'm going to conclude with this image, uh, again, kind of pre-essent of a lot of things uh, from the early 20th century of someone who imagined that cinema, in fact, uh, is not only an exterior form of projection, uh, but it's a form of disegno, it's a form of design that, in fact, includes a very much uh, a form of imaging that's forms of imagination and imagining. Thank you.